Hi, I'm Russell Beard. I'm here for Earthrise on the Isle of Egg to introduce us to the energy conscious islanders. And I'm Sinead O'Shea, and I'm following a movement to bring luscious, sustainable green spaces to America's biggest city. And I'm Yara Bamolham in the Jordan Valley, looking at how simple permaculture principles are bringing the desert to life. And I'm Sergio Quintana in Arcata, California, learning how to flush with pride. Many people believe that by the year 2050, the world could be powered entirely by renewable energy. I'm Russell Beard, and I'm here on Scotland's northwest coast to meet 82 islanders who are leading the way. The Isle of Egg lies off the Scottish mainland across 11 kilometers of rough water. Whoa. Too remote for connection to the mainland electricity grid, the extraordinary islanders built their own. Today was 15 gusting up to sort of 25. So it was a pretty so calm day. Oh, very, pretty calm day, yeah. There. Right. The almost constant wind is the first of Egg's precious renewable resources. What, what, what's this here? You've got your wrench. Is this the, the, we're going we're to check wrench, the base bolts. We're going bolts. to use that to check the uh, tension of the bolts. It's, it's a knackering job doing that. That's <laughs> it, it. It, it's yeah. a, you can just feel it just tightening it up. I guess over time, the very slight vibrations of the constant wind uh, will loosen these bolts. So it's just a kind of ongoing process to keep them tight. But wind is only one of the renewable energy sources the islanders rely on. The four six kilowatt wind turbines are linked by an underground cable to a 30 kilowatt photovoltaic array and from there to three hydroelectric turbines. But the trick with renewable energy is that you have to be able to store it and that's where the state of the art battery system comes in. Power is available 24 hours a day to everybody all the time. Even the, the installers that didn't know whether it would work. Nobody's ever done this before. So the, Which the, is a bit incredible because yeah. it's so simple. What exactly had never been done before? That sounds very interesting. Nobody has ever... Combining the three energies, yeah. as they, as it was it Ian Cartwright who was the, yeah. was the big brains behind it, was like, will, will they sing together? And the lead singer in this three-part harmony is the main hydro generator, the backbone of Egg's power grid. But as with most stars, Getting up close can be difficult. We were driving up here with Eddie, and they've had some really stormy weather the last week there, and our, our trees come down and blocked the way. So he's gone off in the vehicle, and he's going to come and meet us at the other end. We're going to walk up here to the weir, to where they have one of the uh, main hydro um, generators, and that's like one of the key uh, power sources of the island. So we're going to go up and have a look at that just now. Mind your head. <laughs> The water that falls over this notch and collects in the box yeah. underneath it runs down the pipe here, and that pipe goes nearly a kilometre to where the hydro is, which is nearly 100 metres below us. So all the turbine and the actual moving parts, that's all down that's at the other end? That's all a kilometre away okay. um, at the bottom of the, as we'll see, the cliff. Water flowing from the island's peak provides up to 112 kilowatts of hydroelectricity from the main generator alone. And when energy levels fall off, water is redirected through the generator, driving more power back into the grid, topping up the storage batteries. What we're doing all the time is we're balancing what the island is using. Wow, there it is again. That's amazingly loud. You can hear the force being generated by that water rushing down nearly 100 meters. It's amazing, you can really feel it. You can feel the vibrations in the room as well. <laughs> the system was originally funded by government grants and prize money, but now it must pay for itself. Hello. Hello. I'm Maggie. I'm Maggie. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I understand you are the lady to ask about um, buying Electricity cards? Yes, Is I can it? do that. I can sell you a card, yeah. That would be great, please. Yeah. We decided when we were putting the system in that it would be a really good idea to have prepayment meters. So that takes away the sort of whole admin side of sending out electric bills every quarter and what have you. If there's plenty power, 
we put, we put up a green poster saying use as much energy as you want. But if, um, you know, the water's low, for instance, we put up a red sign that says, you know, please try and conserve your, your energy use. You. And it works. There you go. Put that somewhere safe now. <laughs> yeah. Right. Look at it there. Yeah. yeah, you try it, you do it. OK. It's just in here? Yeah. Just poke it in? Yeah. That's done it. And that's it. Zap. Yeah. Brilliant. And so give, now... Give, give you all the power in the world. Jamie Arda represents a new generation of islanders. He came here to set up an adventure tourism business. Without uh, our grid here, without the 24-7 um, power, mm -hmm. do you think it would have been feasible, as feasible, for you to come and, and start a new life here? It's made it so much easier, having the grid. Uh, definitely, definitely. I mean, the island has so many draws anyway, not just the power thing, you know, but because of the power, it's just brought people here that maybe wouldn't have been able to set up home here. It's clear that, although it's renewable energy that powers this island, it's the community that makes it work. For the first time in history, more people live in cities than in rural areas. The problem is that cities consume about 75% of the world's resources and are responsible for pumping out more than two-thirds of global carbon emissions. What if we could reduce their carbon footprint and make cities more sustainable? In the city that never sleeps, a growing movement of local government departments, NGOs and private individuals is attempting to improve the urban environment by building green spaces across the city. This is Marnie Marjorelle from Alive Structures. Hi. What are we going to do today? We are going to see a lot of different sites today that I think are great examples of how the city is changing. Our first stop is the High Line, a disused mile and a half long railway line that has recently been turned into a public park on the west side of Manhattan. We have tons of air pollution um, and a lot of people with asthma in the city. And we have urban heat island effect, sure. which is just when cities are about 10 degrees hotter than everywhere else. And then we have a lot of runoff, stormwater runoff, which is a big problem. So these are all consequences of not having a lot of vegetation, not having a lot of permeable surfaces. So when you have all of a sudden a natural habitat, you have a way to absorb water, you're cooling the air temperature, you're cleaning the air. So you're doing a lot of good things for the environment that are badly needed in a city. So I guess people around here must really love this. It must have brought a lot of benefits to the area. Yeah, the New Yorkers are really messed up. We have so much pressure going on in our heads. We're so fast paced. Everything is just so intense. Coming into a space like this, it has such an impact. I mean, you just feel like, huh. can't just have endless buildings and it doesn't work for our psyche and it doesn't work environmentally. Our next stop is to the Bronx, America's poorest congressional district and an area which has very few green spaces. We are coming to see a green wall built to hide a recycling plant and to also provide employment opportunities. Hi, my name is Colleen, former student of the state of South Bronx. This is our vine wall. We had to use vine wall in 2010. Vines grow pretty rapidly. So you might see some hanging down. You don't want them to hang down like this. You have to train them to go up the trenches. The neighborhood that I grew up in, I didn't see anything like this. Right. In order for me to really see grass, I had to either go to the south or my, my, my father lives in Jamaica, then you go over there, you see trees, you see grass. Mm. So my thing with getting into ecology, I wanted to see more green in the urban areas. Mm. And the only way I could see that is if I had a hand in it. Okay. So I came and I took the course, and I, um, at first I didn't think that I was gonna be able to do it, but here I am, I'm actually running a whole smart roof program. So, yeah, it works.
We're in Brooklyn now. What exactly are we doing here? We are visiting a client of ours. We installed a green roof last year um, on her building, and I'm gonna give you a tour of it. The environmental benefits for the whole community are huge. Think about how many roofs in New York City could look like this, and people could be using it. I mean, we don't have that much green space in the city, so this is underutilized real estate. From the roof garden, we head to Greenpoint in Brooklyn and to the Eagle Street Roof Farm, which is set up to provide locally grown produce for the community. What do you say to people when they ask you why it's important to try and eat locally if you possibly can? It's as basic as having fewer trucks on the road that destroy our, our air and cause air pollution. It's also just so incredibly different in terms of taste. Like something that comes fresh out of the ground. It does not resemble what you get at the supermarket where it's grown for purposes other than taste. It's grown for, you know, to last long, a long time on the shelf. Pretty much all cities have the space to grow their own food. And aside from the ecological impact of it, it's, it also just creates this community around food that I think, you know, it's, it's something all people everywhere share. So it's very easy to, to foster that. And so then this is the kind of product that a restaurant will buy. Yeah, absolutely. There's actually a pizzeria, right? a few blocks away from here called Poly G's and they buy a, a lot of our kale and they have a, a rooftop pie which is, I mean I'm sure I have a biased opinion but I think it's the best pizza in the world. <laughs> it's amazing. Following Tusha's top tip, we walk around the corner to Poly G's to try the kale pizza and to meet up with climate scientist Stuart Gaffin. What do you recommend? Well you definitely want to get the widest shade of kale. This is a big favorite of mine and it's all from right down on Eagle Street. We have this opportunity to bring back um, biodiversity and, and fascinating new ways to cities. Two of the projects I've been working on are um, restoring endangered ecosystems that used to be common to the region and are all but wiped out. And we have found that they can actually thrive under the right conditions on green roofs. The other thing I love is the idea of what's called eco-corridors in cities, where in New York, there are things that we know that there are like sort of parks that are separated by too much distance and you can't get um, uh, visitors, biological visitors, birds and pollinators to, to migrate easily from one park to another one. And so we realize now these can create what are called eco-corridors. I love that idea. And um, even bird migration, I mean, there's just, the list goes on and on and on. It's very delicious. <laughs> it's been a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Marty. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Ninety-two percent of Jordan is desert, but the Jordan Valley was renowned for centuries as being one of the most lush and productive lands in the world. But years of overgrazing and drought have left it arid with high salinity levels. I'm Yara Bimolham and Joastra Jordan, looking at how simple permaculture principles are bringing the desert back to life. Just two and a half years ago, the site looked like this, and now look at all these trees growing naturally. Jeff Lawton is turning 3,000 square metres of the Jordanian desert into an oasis. The Australian is using permaculture, a method that develops ecosystems intended to be sustainable and self-sufficient. It's located in the Jordan Valley, 400 metres below sea level, the lowest place on Earth. The people of Joastra are poor because their region is arid and their soil salty. Once you've salted the landscape a metre or two, then you have to wash through with more and more water all the time to get the salt to wash down into the lower layers. In hot, dry climates, surface water evaporates quickly, drawing up moisture and with it salts, such as sodium chloride, sodium sulfate, potassium and magnesium, which are dissolved in groundwater. 
This creates a surface buildup which is toxic to many plants, making the land unusable for agriculture. Eventually you end up with 20 metres of salted soil and you're out of production for a thousand years. The first step to reversing the process is to reduce evaporation. Everything you do is an anti-evaporation strategy of design. So mulching, sunken beds, shade over the vegetable garden and increased organic matter. So this here is uh, compost. Yep, this is compost in process. So I'm going to put in this compost thermometer and almost like a compost doctor, I'm going to just do a bit of an analysis of our temperatures. What sort of heat range do you need? Ideally, 55 degrees centigrade to 65, because that's where the most organisms are. A compost heap like this will take up to 20 days to make, but can feed the soil for up to 17 years. It's really warm. It's hot and wet. That's what we want. You want the moisture to I stay in I want to retain it. the moisture. I want it to get finer and finer, darker and darker, less and less smell, and end up at the end just warm, dark brown, with a little bit of woody material left in it, and then it's got all the beneficial life to grow those plants in a sustainable, organic way. Not only that, but it acts like probiotic health for the soil. Well, it's inoculate in the soil with beneficial organisms that make the plants not only 50% more water retentive, but also it gives the plants uh, protection from any diseases or pests. It's like a shield over the plants. Jeff is creating a demonstration site where he's training people how to live sustainably with limited water and resources. Permaculture enthusiasts are coming from around the world to learn about the compost techniques. They'll be taking these principles to places as far afield as Afghanistan, Peru and Ghana, but Jeff is more interested in training the locals. Then just scoop out that little dish and then compost. Here's my Ian? Yeah. Ah, eye. This is called the eye in Arabic then. The site isn't finished yet, but already local Jordanians are feeling the benefits. The aim is to get an economically sustainable system running within three years. I, I think it all just gets better from here as long as we've got local people adopting these systems. And that's what we're here for. We're here to demonstrate and educate. That's our main mission. Globally, two million tons of sewage, industrial and agricultural waste, is discharged into the world's waterways every year. I'm Sergio Quintana, and I'm at the Arcata Marsh and Wildlife Sanctuary, which is home to the city of Arcata's innovative sewage treatment facility. It turns wastewater into a thriving ecosystem. I'm going to show you my favorite spot here to look at birds, oh, cool. where the bird's habitat is. All right. Your shoes are very noisy. <laughs> you need to be quiet to okay. see birds. Ah, there's one right there. I think it's going to be another black Phoebe. Oh, yeah. Do you see it? Yeah. OK, I see him. Yeah. Denise yeah. and I are bird watching in a wastewater treatment plant. These wetlands are cleaning Arcata's wastewater while giving the locals a great place to come and hang out. Historically, it was a salt marsh, not a usable land. Mm -hmm. And so the goal was to drain it and make it usable land. We started the constructed wetlands, and over time, the bird list just increases and increases and increases. So that idea that your wastewater is a resource is basically what's created this. Yes, very much so. I mean, the community uses it, and we actually have visitors from all over the world coming here, some of them for the bird watching. Yeah. Some of them because they've heard about our innovative wastewater system, they want to see it for themselves. Some of them 
uh, because they want to take these ideas home to their city council and say, hey, we want one of these. Arcata's innovative sewage system still begins, however, just like all those others. We're walking on the Brown River here. I can smell that. <laughs> this is our primary clarifier, this big circular tank. That's fecal material, uneaten food, toilet paper, whatever. That's our <laughs> primary solids. Primary get solids, pushed got it. into a hopper and get pumped out of the tank on out to the oxidation pots from here. Like any others, the oxidation ponds use algae to produce oxygen, which is then used by bacteria that break down the organic compounds found in human and food waste. But it's the treatment marshes that follow that are the innovative part of the process. Their primary job is to remove the algae used in the oxidation ponds using sunlight and plants. Unlike traditional methods, they use energy, machinery, and chemicals. Welcome to Humboldt and Arcata Marsh Research Institute. Hey, thanks for having me. Professor Robert Gearhart is one of the architects of the system. This is uh, what the open surface wetland looks like. So you don't get the algae here because this blocks the sunlight for the most part from the top. This, this plant can produce uh, this green material with a lot less sunlight and is very important because the photosynthesis from that green leaf, the oxygen, the byproduct, goes into the water column and is used by bacteria to treat the wastewater but it's also used as a food for the birds. And this is what a treatment marsh looks like. This is cool. It's like you're climbing into a jungle. So this is the algae water from that other pond? This is the algae water about halfway through this process. Just try to get the water. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's why we wear the gloves. <laughs> All right, let's see. I'm going to... See if I can get any better at this. <laughs> now, right. now, this water does not look as green as this water. Well, you're exactly right. This is this is the water after it's had a chance to go through the treatment wetlands. Okay. So the algae from the oxidation ponds has settled under the shade of the cattail and the bulrush, and we have a much cleaner water. After the treatment marshes, the water is disinfected with chlorine to get rid of any waterborne diseases because people use the next stage of the treatment process, the enhancement marshes, as a recreational resource. The water is dechlorinated before moving into these enhancement marshes where remaining organic matter, which lowers oxygen levels, nutrients that can cause algal blooms, and heavy metals, toxic to marine life, are all significantly reduced. Finally, the water is again disinfected and dechlorinated before it's discharged into Humboldt Bay. A further innovation is planned for this time next year, disinfecting with ultraviolet light. So this is the last step of the innovation? Yes, this is the last point of wetland treatment. And we're gonna see some uh, really clean water when we look in here. It is really, really clean. Look at that color. What color? <laughs> Nothing in there. Very clean. In terms of the clarity, this is the level of treatment that is discharged to the bay and is significantly better than the standard that's required. The real advantage of this, it does take a lot of space and a lot of area, is you have all these other uses associated with the same space. Makes you feel good just looking at it, doesn't it? <laughs> Makes you thirsty. Yeah. <laughs> Something Arcadians are proud of. Originally, they started out with a little celebration called Flush with Pride. You know, it's an innovative way to do things, and the community just stands behind it. It's just not like any other wastewater treatment plant. How are you? What's the plan? The plan, I'm going to put some cow poo in the digester. It's cow poo in the digester? OK. Is that you? 